Hey, C. Stratsky here. Welcome back to the show. I wanted to walk you guys through some updates in terms of what's happening with foreign investment, foreign capital in Canada's housing markets, particularly here in Vancouver and, of course, in the GTA, the two largest markets in Canada. Uh, so just this past week, we had the federal government, Krista Freeland, came out and says they're extending the foreign buyers ban in Canada for another two years. Now, keep in mind, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, starting in January of last year, 2023, the federal government introduced a two-year ban on all foreign buyer purchases. So it said, okay, it's going to be a two-year ban, and then we'll sort of revisit it. And so obviously, we've got an election coming up in 2025. The government's looking at all sorts of housing policies to sort of regain some credibility. So they've decided to sort of prematurely expand that foreign buyers ban into 2027. Um, now, the interesting thing is, again, we're going to walk through this, but just the number of sort of loopholes and obvious signs that I think people should be paying attention to. First of all, the foreign buyers ban doesn't apply to students and it doesn't apply to temporary workers, right? And so if you think about the foreign buyer, you know, ultimately what we have in Canada is a situation where the foreign buyers are actually predominantly Canadian citizens or permanent residences or students, right? So there was that famous article, I think, from back in 2016, where it was like the the uh, the, the, the the university student bought like the $31 million house on the west side of Vancouver at the very tippy top of the market. And they're like, well, hey, hold on a minute, you're a student. How did you buy that $31 million house? Well, that's kind of really, uh, you know, is emblematic of the foreign capital that's in, uh, particularly here in Vancouver. It's not a foreign buyer, it's foreign capital in the market. So, if you look at, keep in mind this foreign buyer ban, right? Remember, the, this is the federal government that came out and we had to actually see MHC and said, hey, hold on, you guys are being like, you guys are like racism. You know, you guys are saying, you know, foreign buyers, there's such a small fraction of the market. It's because the way that you're measuring it, right? The way that you're measuring it is you're just looking at their passport and saying, all right, where, where are you from? Are you a citizen of Canada? Um, and so by that nature, right? You think about this is the BC... Here in BC, we've had a foreign buyer's tax since 2016. It was introduced at a 15% of the purchase price. It was then expanded, I believe it was in 2018. It was increased to 20%. The the uh, the province of Ontario brought in something similar, I believe, in starting in 2017. So if we actually go back and look and say, okay, well, hold on a minute. Before the foreign buyer ban was introduced federally in 2023 after they dragged their feet saying hey you know you guys are xenophobic for even suggesting that foreign buyers are a problem they looked at the polls and finally said okay yeah well, let's bring in a foreign buyer ban in 2023 well m much too late but even if we go back and look at the percentage of foreign buyers in for example here in bc they made up about one percent they made up about one percent of total residential real estate transactions. 1% is a really small number. And so, you know, this, this funny chart here that shows the uh, the number of foreign buyers, you know, front running the, the ban. And it was like 450 uh, some odd buyers front run the, the foreign buyer ban in BC. So it really goes to show you the, the very small percentage as it is measured um, shows you why the federal foreign buyer ban extending it another two years is really, it's not going to do anything. And so if we look at, again, the foreign buyer tax that was introduced in BC in 2016, like you have to ask yourself, has the real estate market got any more affordable for the average person? And I think by all measures, we can say no. What we can say, though, is that the luxury housing market uh, has been quite stagnant. Uh, I, I suppose those homes have become maybe slightly more affordable. Um, but I think most people would measure 
a foreign buyer's tax, for example, say, well, how is it creating affordability? You know, everybody wants housing to be more affordable. And so I say by that sole nature, that policy has been ineffective. And the reality is, is because it's foreign capital that's coming in and it's coming in through, you know, Canada's massive immigration program, right? You know, we talk about a million people a year are being added to the country's population growth, you know, the highest rate in 70 some odd years. And a lot of these people are coming in, they have permanent residency status again, or they have citizenship or they, they are a foreign student. And so they are able to bring this capital offshore into the country. And so you're, the locals that are earning the incomes are competing with uh, that this global foreign wealth that comes to the market. And so uh, all we have to do is look at this blockbuster piece this week from uh, Sam Cooper, uh, which basically highlights uh, an HSBC employee, a whistleblower, uh, blowing the lids off of basically forged income documents, right? So for uh, what was happening was you'd get uh, somebody that owns, you know, three, four properties in BC or the GTA. In this one particular example, a woman who owned uh, three detached houses in Aurora, Markham, and Scarborough, she was working part-time as a hairdresser in the GTA, part-time as a hairdresser, but she was claiming, you know, $536,000 a year is a business manager in Guangzhou. Um, and so, you know, that, I mean, it was an element of mortgage fraud. How do you verify that income over in China? You're telling me you're just here and you're a business manager, but you're making half a million over there. There's no real great ability of, of this, this banks to go and investigate the legitimacy of those incomes. And so you come here with your boat, your buckets of wealth, you, you know, you create a, a fake income document. You get a mortgage from the bank, you buy a couple properties, you inflate the value of the real estate. Um, and, that, and that's certainly happening to extend. The other thing is you have a lot of, you know, business owners that are, again, coming in from China and just they're coming here to part cash. You know, you think about this, like the realities of it is it, it's a communist country. You're seeing it now, right? You see these like high profile CEOs, founders, you know. Uh, Jack Ma, Alibaba, you know, suddenly the guy just goes missing. He disappears for six months, you know, and his company is basically being handed over and he's being replaced at the top of the helm. Like it's a communist country. And so like if I was operating and living in, in that country, the first thing I would do is if I had any legitimate wealth, I would get it out of that country or illegitimate wealth. I would get it out of that country. And I would park it into safe havens like the United States or Canada, uh, which is very friendly to, uh, you know, dare I say, uh, money laundering and illicit funds. And again, there, there's all these, you know, reports on the Vancouver model, bags of cash coming in uh, into casinos and, and underground, um, you know, through duffel bags. It's just the stories go on and on and on. So. This is why I always come full circle, though, at the end of the day, when people say, I know I love these charts that go up uh, and they always make the big media headlines and they say, oh, um, you know, it takes 25 years to save for a down payment uh, for, when you're looking at incomes in Vancouver to house prices. And it's like, this is not a market that operates on incomes. It's a market that operates on wealth, particularly global wealth. And I and I understand the frustrations and the disgust and the stain that the social contract in Canada has it has largely been broken, right? The, the social contract is you go to school, you get a good education, you get a decent job that pays you a nice paycheck. And then you are able to then buy a house and raise a family and live a decent life. And that social contract, of course, has been broken because the ability, uh, you know, to, to that, that decent job doesn't get you a house. You know, it's unless you have some pre-existing wealth or some family wealth that they can then help you with the down payment, you don't get on the housing ladder. Um, and, and that, that's just the reality. And that's, I can, and that's why I understand the frustration uh, from so many of the citizens. But I mean, my view is that at the end of the day is I, I'm not going to be able to change this. I can certainly expose it for what it is. Uh, so you have to operate in the environment that, that you can, that you can operate. You have to, you know, 
you and I aren't going to change this. Uh, you have to operate in this environment and put yourself and look out for your family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's what I come full circle to these, these policies. And, and again, looking at, you know, price to income ratios, because this, this is a global market that is, it's traded off of wealth. And every first time home buyer that I've worked with, you know, been doing selling real estate for 10 years, I haven't worked with a first time home buyer that's, that's scraped together their own money without family help. You know, whether that family help was only 25 grand or 50 grand, or in some cases, a million dollars, um, people are extracting the existing wealth because mom and dad's house went from $300,000 to $3 million. And so they say, well, what's it for me to scrape 200K off the top and hand it to my kids? I'd rather than I'd rather front that inheritance today than have them leave and have my grandkids leave and go to a different province. Um, I'd rather keep them. I'd rather cut them a check of two hundred grand today and keep them close to me. And and that's really what we see uh, in this market. So I kind of wanted to bring that to everybody's attention. It, it's interesting to see now, right? We're going to see um, this is a market that we know is is benefited. Uh, tremendously off of uh, you know the Chinese wealth coming into this country, uh, and again, particularly in Vancouver and Toronto. And so I'm really watching. I'm really watching with fascination of what's happening with the Chinese real estate bubble. Uh, I think we've all known it's been a bubble for years and years and years, and uh, you know we're starting to see the issues actually emerging. Right, China Evergrande liquidating all their assets. Country Garden probably the next shoe to drop. Uh, and you're starting to to hear reports, to see reports that are talking about uh, some of these Chinese entities selling off large commercial assets in other countries in order to repatriate capital and and clean up balance sheets back home. And so that's one of the things that we're we'll watching for is as this turmoil unfolds over in China, how is that going to impact? markets. On one hand, I look at it and say, hmm, you know, again, if I'm a Chinese citizen watching what's happening with the with the stock market over there, watching the crisis unfold in their real estate market, I'm still a guy personally that I'd like, I need to get my capital out of here and I need to get it into a safe haven. On the flip side, you're needing you're needing to repatriate capital to clean up balance sheets back home. And so I'm waiting to watch and see how this is going to unfold. Uh, my proxy, my proxy for foreign capital, this is a simple anecdotal process, is how are luxury pre-sale developments performing? So the luxury pre-sale condos in Vancouver that sell at 2000 a foot, 2300 a foot, 2800 bucks a square foot. How are those performing? Because there's the local market isn't buying those. The local market really can't quite support those valuations. And so it's a market that heavily relies on foreign investment. And that market has struggled and it really has struggled since about 2000 and 18 onwards and it hasn't recovered and so i'm really watching that market for any sort of signs of further stress or a glimpse of a rebound and i'm just not seeing anything it's just a crappy market that continues to struggle along you know you might have seen it in the media or in the news or that post that's circulating around right like one of the luxury condo towers that's pre-selling in downtown Vancouver today, right? Is is you know they're offering free Porsches. You know they're really trying to hit their their pre-sale targets and kind of started to struggle. And so hey, you know you buy a pre-sale, we'll give you a Porsche. And uh, you know that's usually not a great sign that sales are going tremendously well. And we're seeing this as some key mark luxury buildings that have just completed or are coming up for completion, I would highly encourage you to keep a close eye on those developments. Um, 
I think that we're going to see, and I think we are seeing significant uh, losses in those projects. Then I think they're going to continue. So, um, as always, I hope that helped. I thought it was very interesting to sort of see, to kind of top it all off. Uh, you really can't script this. You can't script this any better. It's, it's amazing. So, remember, the BC government brings in the foreign buyer tax. Uh, the Ontario government brought in their foreign buyer tax. And then the federal government came in and says, well, we're going to bring in a foreign buyer ban. So that makes those taxes non-existent. You, you cannot buy real estate as a foreign buyer. There's a foreign buyer ban. So the foreign buyer basically ban removed tax revenues from those two governments. And then just in the last couple of weeks, the city of Toronto, their new mayor, she's proposing a new legislation that the city of Toronto wants to charge their own foreign buyer tax, 10% foreign buyer tax. But foreign buyers are banned. So how how do you collect tax revenues? You can't make this up. I don't know these politicians sometimes. Uh, they do make me chuckle. But uh, I thought I would share that with you guys this week. Keep an eye on all those uh, stories developing here. Lots to keep an eye on. As always, hope that helped. I'll see you next week. If you're looking to buy or sell real estate in Vancouver, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation. I sometimes have people say they didn't reach out because they were nervous, or they thought I was too busy, or they thought I was just a talking head on YouTube. But in fact, I help people buy and sell real estate in Vancouver every single day. My team is in the top 1% of realtors in Greater Vancouver in terms of sales volumes. That's 14,000 plus realtors in the entire Greater Vancouver area. So again, don't hesitate to reach out. If you want to do that, there's a link in the description where you can book a 30 minute calendar consultation. We can have a conversation. I can walk you through how we work with our clients as a trusted advisor in some of the biggest decisions of your life. And so happy to have that conversation.